let's take a look at some pieces, a male and female, from um, around the 1880s, late 1880s. Um, two pieces that were kind of driven by fashion um, at that time. I have a jacket here known as the Zouave jacket. The Zouave was a military unit of Middle Eastern um, origin. And uh, this is particular to the costume and the jacket that they would wear. Not that it had a fitted waist and all these, um, you know, more female touches to it, but it was a very uh, short, rather high hip length jacket. And traditional was this wider sleeve, the Zouave sleeve, so a bit of a bell at the bottom. And then this type of soutache trim. This type of trim was, you know, part of that military costume. Uh, the French had trained the Zouave. Uh, the French always have wonderful costumes for military leaders. And that really was brought back um, to Europe um, and be started to become a part of female style in the 1880s. So you can see here, I'm gonna hold this up, a very, very fitted waist. Now this jacket, we know um, could fit, and this is an outerwear jacket. It's so heavy, it is um, a wool melton. It was lined, it currently has no lining. The lining has come out um, or shredded because it was silk. But we can see the back here has this rather peplum feel to it and this uh, pleating at the back that it would fit over um, any form of bustle. So depending if you were an older woman, you might have the bustle of 1870. Uh, if you were a modern Millie, you might have the uh, 1880 version of the bustle, and that was more shelf-like. But this jacket would accommodate any type of back treatment. Um, you can see how nipped in the waist is. It is very um, detailed with all of this different type of princess seaming, as we call it today, and then um, the soutache uh, decoration. Uh, very, very much uh, very fitted at the waist. And then the detailing here in the front. The uh, front drops down. It has a, uh, almost gives you a bit of a Russian feel with this collar, put the sleeves out here. There are actually pockets that were placed in here at the hip length, uh, but the front hangs down a little bit longer than the back, which lets us know that the back accommodated a fullness and the front fit very smoothly um, on the front of the uh, female wearing this. So the, the front definitely has a bit of length on that. Uh, pointing out just a little bit of construction here that we rarely do today unless we're buying um, in a designer or luxury price point. But all of these seams are taped with a, what we call today a Hong Kong finish. Back then it was a very French finish. And um, they were all taped, uh, support here around the hem, and then lining would have been added over this. Today, in modern manufacturing, we don't even do anything to the seams at all. We might serge them so they don't uh, separate, but definitely uh, we skip a few steps in modern production, mainly to bring the price points down so that everyone can afford a Zouave jacket. So there you go. Uh, we'll stay on um, rather female items for the moment. I wanted to point out just a scarf. Um, over scarves to be worn over outerwear. Uh, this would have been an outdoor scarf because of the weight of it. Uh, these were um, to add beauty to, to overcoats. Uh, outerwear, we've learned in our class that people kept it for 10 years. You know, in Arizona, we keep it for 40 years because we wear it once a year. But in colder climates, um, their outerwear was something that they did um, it was more expensive to purchase because of the thickness and the quilting inside. And um, to update that, you would pick something uh, that definitely was in an artistic movement. This one you can see as we go into Art Nouveau period that it's got a lot of nature involved with it. We know that that's typical of that art movement. Um, and a beautiful, beautiful uh, silk velvet. And um, this is just something that would have been added as an accessory to outerwear. No other purpose than to show that you had knowledge of current art movements and you were updating your 10-year-old overcoat. Moving over here to menswear, um, 
in the, we learned, you know, in the 1870s that the tuxedo really starts to take off. We have in wealthy class of, uh, you know, the, uh, in America we've got um, railroad builders and bankers and all of these people that, you know, it's not royalty anymore. It is people that have created businesses and these businesses grow to be even national businesses at that time. Um, and there begins to be a pecking order in what you wear during the day. And if working class people can have an evening suit, what are you going to do to show that you are on and above the working class? You have your opera wear or your um, really formal after um, eight o'clock. These cutaway jackets were worn originally. Steamboat captains might wear them, military might wear them in the 1850s, but by the time we get to the 1880s and 90s, we see this become really only used for formal wear. And even today you will see a cutaway often for weddings. Now these were never worn before eight o'clock, then they moved to five o'clock. <laughs> we see them here in Arizona at some of the galas that are put on for charity. Um, but uh, these were, you know, today at weddings, we'll see them at one and two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so there are no rules anymore, but at this time this was made, there was definitely a rule. And when I say cut away, I mean that the front of the jacket is literally cut away. You just have this piece right at the, at the ends of the natural waistline um, of the male figure. And then there is a set of tails, almost penguin-like, at the back of the jacket. So this one, let me see if I can get that put together. It's really coming apart, but we'll be able to see some of the construction. So if you think of Phantom of the Opera and that type of garment worn for very formal, uh, that's what these were all about showing uh, that you had a set of clothes for all the different things that occurred during the day if you were a business person. I wanted to point out here inside some of the construction and this is really amazing. This is something that would have been in a more northern climate in perhaps Chicago, New York, Boston, um, but this is very heavily quilted. This would have been a piece for um, fall and winter. The wool is beautifully smooth. It's a beautiful worsted smooth wool, fairly lightweight, um, but the, the warmth is created in the lining. This is all quilted here, a bit of a horizontal quilting here, and then actually a leaf pattern um, that was right under the arm here. It also gave the male form um, if you were a little skinny, it kind of filled you out and gave you kind of the, the uh, curve that was in at that time for uh, the male figure. I'm going to turn it over though so you can see some of the construction underneath. And that quilting is literally um, attached to um, a filler here. And this is just actually a, a um, batting of wool. This is woolen fibers that are lightly felted together and um, used almost like we would use insulation in a home. It was literally added to um, the jacket, both front and back, and then the lining was put over this. So this definitely would be a very heavyweight jacket, and this was meant to be worn. Um, if we see some of the movies about this time period, um, these wonderful mansions, you know, still again, we don't have forced heat and air like we do today. Uh, they would have had either uh, furnaces in each room, um, perhaps they go out on the veranda and it's snowing. Uh, this coat was meant for that type of an evening. Going from the opera to your carriage, you would be kept warm and you wouldn't need outerwear to cover up your beautiful set of tails. So that shows us a little bit of the uniqueness of this time. And I'm going to see you in the next one. We're going to talk a little bit about lingerie, what goes underneath.